Hello everyone and good afternoon to the SimScale workshop, workshop session uh, on Formula One. Uh, today we'll be talking about the topic of internal flow analysis. Thank you everyone for joining the webinar and uh, I hope that everybody's going to have a lot of fun and a lot of new insights about simulation in Formula One during the next hour. Uh, let's just take a quick look where we are at. Today we are in the third session of the webinar series. We'll be talking about the flow analysis of an exhaust manifold. This is today's topic. So again, we are back on CFD after we had a structural simulation last week. Um, next week we'll be uh, doing uh, another session and then there's going to be a fifth one uh, right after that. So today we'll be talking about, again about uh, flow analysis um, problem and I think this is uh, a really uh, a really relevant topic for all of those who are interested in Formula One simulation. So uh, we prepared a, a little agenda for today. Uh, first of all we'll, we'll take a short look at the homework from the last time. Um, then we will discuss briefly about internal flows in Formula One. Uh, we will check out a little bit uh, about um, simulation setups with SimScale. That means we will see how can you actually simulate uh, an internal uh, simulation that is relevant in Formula One with SimScale. For this purpose we have pre uh, prepared the one that you see on the right which is the exhaust manifold flow. Um, after that we will of course do some interpretation. That means uh, any result is only as good as, uh, as it provides a valuable insight on, on what you should actually do and how you can pr uh, improve your design. Uh, so we will spend some time on that. Uh, and finally, as usual, we are going to have another homework assignment, um, number three, um, which will be presented at the end. And then we will have some time, uh, some dedicated time to discuss a few questions and answers that you might have. Let me just uh, quickly introduce myself. My name is Johannes. I'm the director of the fluid mechanics department here at SimScale. Um, and uh, today I will be conducting this session with uh, a fellow presenter. Um, actually, uh, he is senior engineer here at SimScale. His name is Bavak. Uh, I'm just, uh, just going to hand over the mic um, to let him say a couple of words. Okay, hello everyone. This is Bavak and it is very good to be here to have this, uh, I would say, very interesting topic to, uh, to discuss. Um, of course, we're going to go through the details that Johannes uh, just mentioned and later in the workshop I'm going to uh, take you through the setting up of the simulation and some details and hopefully we're going to have some interesting discussion. So I will hand this back to Johannes now. All right, thank you for the introduction, Babak. Um, so Babak is going to be back with you once we talk about the simulation. But for now, let's just start uh, quickly uh, with uh, looking back at the last uh, homework that we had. Um, first of all, thank you so much for all you've done, for all the submissions. It was really great to see all of you simulating, uh, and, and there's, there were so many, uh, so many great submissions. Um, that was really, really nice to see, and we were really happy with it. Um, if you were not able to, to submit your homework until now, you can still do that uh, until, um, uh, until next Thursday. That is cool. That is absolutely no problem. Um, and uh, of course, there's going to be another uh, homework this time, which you can also uh, submit within uh, the next week. Um, as we had it last time, there's going to be some, some help, some uh, material to assist you in setting up the simulation. If you go to simscale.com slash workshops, there's a dedicated page for this workshop. This is also where you registered. Uh, we have uh, an FAQ section there, which shows you like the most frequently asked questions, gives you answers to some, some of the questions, uh, and it also shows uh, some hints and tutorials and all that you need in order to set up this, the homework successfully. On the right, we can actually see uh, the picture of um, one of the possible solutions or one of, uh, an example submission. Um, it shows the temperature field on a wheel on a rim, basically. So we had the situation that the vehicle is actually braking, and that means there is heat introduced 
uh, here in the middle of the wheel and it spreads out uh, and we of course we don't want the tires to get too hot so uh, in effect the simulation did help us uh, to to determine this and uh, we can actually well use this to improve the wheels to an extent to really ensure that the wheels don't get too hot overall okay so much for the homework from last time now let's uh, dive into our new topic which is internal flows in formula 1 um First of all, we should be talking about what is an internal flow in the first place. Uh, internal flow means that we have a flow through a device that is basically not, well, it's corresponding to external aerodynamics, which is the, well, you may call it opposite. So external aerodynamics was something that we covered in the first session, and today we'll cover internal, you can call it aerodynamics or internal flow phenomena um, this time. Uh, we have a few examples just to give you an impression where do we have internal flow in Formula 1 cars, and there are actually many different places. Uh, for example, here on the left we have a picture of a brake cooling. Um, brakes do get really hot when, when you have to, uh, to convert the kinetic energy of the vehicle into thermal energy. That means you have a brake disc which gets extremely hot and it needs to be cooled. And uh, the only material which is out there which can cool disc brakes uh, is air, so we need to make sure that the design of the brakes actually allow the air to efficiently cool down the brake once it is hot. Um, also, brakes are rotating devices. That means they can act like a pump. And in order to simulate the effects, these pumping effects that a brake disc creates, um, you can use CFD in order to really get some valuable insights um, about this. The middle picture um, has, has the title UHTM, which, call, which uh, means Underhood Thermal Modeling, and that means basically you simulate everything that is going on under the hood, and there's a lot of, of flows of air currents also going on in there. For example, uh, you need to cool the engine, and that's one topic. You also need, uh, need the driver to get some fresh air and so forth. Um, so there is really uh, a lot going on under the hood, and it highly affects, uh, for example, the drag and the overall performance of the vehicle. So this is something uh, that definitely needs to be well designed, and it's, again, an internal flow because it is bounded by the vehicles, by the vehicle uh, walls itself. Um, the picture on the third is a so-called F-duct. Um, this device is used to, um, to actually um, use some compressed air and divert it onto uh, the rear spoiler um, because that can actually have an influence on uh, drag and also on the downforce of the spoiler and this is going to help um, well, also improving the performance of a racing car, uh, especially in, in, in certain simulations. So this is actually uh, uh, in certain sorry in certain situations. So this is actually used um, to, uh, for example, reduce the drag under certain situations or increase the downforce, depending on what you need. So um, in total, there are a few points which are. Um, where we can actually use internal um, flow simulation uh, in Formula One. Um, first and foremost, we should um, try to reduce pressure drops. Pressure drop means that we lose energy somewhere inside a pipe or, uh, for example, under the hood. Um, when we have a high pressure drop under the hood, that means that the, the forces that we have because of this pressure drop are actually slowing the vehicle down and we don't want this. So we should try to reduce pressure drops. Uh, and again, when we will be talking about the simulation of the exhaust manifold, this is again a situation where we also should reduce pressure drops. And in a minute, we will understand why. Um, another interesting application is we should try to homogenize the flow. Um, again, um, when we have, suppose we have a, a pipe that has a certain cross-section, we want to use the entire cross-sectional area of the pipe. That means the flow uh, should ideally be homogeneous over the cross-sectional area, and this is where, where you um, use simulation to try to improve that. Uh, and again, improve laminar and turbulent mixing. Um, this would be an example um, which is used in also many different places. For example, when you talk about mixing, uh, this is uh, something you have in the engine. Uh, when you want to mix the, um, the fuel with air, you, ha you have to really try to intimately mix uh, the fuel together with the air in order to improve the combustion. Uh, and again, simulation can help you to really uh, make sure that your, your uh, engine has the optimum performance. Now, um, we are stepping towards our 
uh, topic of today, we'll be, we'll be talking about this exhaust manifold and uh, to make sure that everybody knows where to locate this part and, and what its functions are and what the design goals are, uh, we'll be talking about this part uh, for a minute. Um, what you see here is the schematics of a Formula One uh, engine. This is actually a, a typical example. Uh, it's a six-cylinder engine. Um, you have uh, a V engine design. That means you have three pistons on either side, and that makes also uh, that also causes the exhaust manifold to have three intakes, and then um, the flow is being centralized, goes through the turbocharger, and then to the exhaust. So this block here is the engine. We see three cylinders on either side. These devices here, this part here, um, is the exhaust manifold, and as you can see, there are two of them. We will be uh, discussing only one side of them because obviously this problem is symmetric, so it's enough if we optimize one of them, and the second one can, uh, of course, be designed to be mirror symmetric. Um, so this is the overall schematics of the engine design, and now um, we should try to understand what is the purpose of the exhaust manifold in the first place. Um, we see that the exhaust manifold is used to collect together the exhaust gas from three cylinders and um, make the flows join and then direct them onto the turbine of the turbocharger. And the turbocharger is a device which takes the uh, energy from the exhaust gas, namely the energy which is stored in its pressure and its temperature, um, and uses that and converts it um, to mechanical energy, which you can which you can use uh, over this shaft here, and uh, this shaft is again used to drive a compressor, which will then pre-compress um, the ambient air, uh, which is then going to go into the engine. So um, this actually helps us to increase the overall engine performance, um, and uh, and uh, again, this is. Um, useful when we want to downsize our engine. That means we have a small engine with relatively uh, small um, small displacement, but still we try to have as much power as possible. And this is why we use these turbochargers, and in order to optimally drive the turbocharger, we must sure, make sure that the exhaust manifold actually performs well. So what are the main design goals of the turbocharger, um, or no, sorry, of the exhaust manifold? Um, as I said, we collect exhaust gas, and exhaust gas is hot and has high pressure. So we need to try to make this gas go uh, into the turbocharger, and on its way it should lose, ideally, no temperature and no pressure. So we should try to keep the temperature loss and the pressure drop at a minimum. Um, and these two goals are actually the most important design goals for the exhaust manifold. So reduce pressure drop and reduce temperature drop. Good. Um, now we have understood what an exhaust manifold actually is, and um, we have seen what's, what we actually need to do in order to improve the exhaust manifold. Um, now my colleague Babak will help me to show you an actual simulation that's been done on SimScale on that very exhaust manifold, um, and he will give you an overview of what, he ha what we had uh, done in this simulation, and then in the end we will also discuss the results to really see which conclusions we can make out of it. So now I'm going to hand this over to Baba. Okay guys, um, Baba here now. Um, as Johannes mentioned, we are going to start going through setting up a simulation on this internal flow for the uh, exhaust manifold. And um, I will try to be as um, as clear as I can be on, on every step so you guys can follow. And of course, you're encouraged to, um, to later do it yourself or do your presentation. If you have any remarks or questions, just present it and we try to go through them uh, as we go forward. Okay, so... Uh, <clears throat> In the slide here, you can see a typical workflow to set up a simulation um, for a fluid mechanics application. So if you look at um, the picture at the left, so uh, here we have prepared a CAD model. And um, the first step to start a simulation is to upload this CAD model to the platform. Of course, I'm going to take it to the platform. 
We're going to go over these steps again. So this is just a, uh, a demonstration of the uh, typical steps that we have to take. So once we have the, uh, we have the uh, CAD model and the platform, the next step is to generate a mesh for it. Of course, depending on the application, depending on um, what uh, specifics you have in mind, uh, the designer might decide for different types of mesh, but that's another topic for now. We're going to focus on, uh, on just generating a mesh that is suitable for this case and uh, is going to help us uh, set up the simulation easily. And once we have that, as you can see in the middle, we're going to move forward to, uh, to setting up the simulation. So setting up a simulation is generally consists of several steps. It could be um, defining the type of material we have, defining the boundary conditions, initial conditions. So it simply means that we really are going to define every aspect of our physical, uh, physical uh, system before running a simulation. And once everything is set, once we're happy with the, with the, uh, with the setup, we're going to run the simulation. The solver is going to typically take some time to solve the flow. And it gives us the results, as you can see, on the right. So um, again, as, um, as was mentioned, for example, in this case, we have some, uh, some typical parameters that we want to look at. It could be temperature. It could be pressure. So it means that we're going to visualize our results based on these two parameters or anything else we have. And that's the way we actually make our design decisions. So uh, of course, the decisions could be anything, could be the operating conditions, could be the geometry. But um, these are the ways we actually start approaching a final design. OK, so, um, so if you're ready, now I'm going to switch the platform and we go through the steps one by one. Okay, so here you see I am um, I'm in the uh, in my account on the platform, and I have this F1 exhaust project as you can see it on the left. So here on the right you see different components of the of the simulation. As we discussed, we have geometries, uh, we have meshes, the way we want to set up the simulation, and of course we're going to use these simulation runs to do some post processing and finally make some design decisions. So. Let's start with the first step, uploading a, um, a CAD model. So in, an, in, a, in a project, when you start, you can, for example, take this one, upload the geometry, or even go inside this mesh creator and have a geometry, as you can see here. So you see, as I click here, our geometry is going to load. There are different components. And of course, once you have it, you can play around with it. Make sure this is the geometry you want. You can also maybe play around with different components of the geometry to, see, to, to finally be sure that this is the one geometry you have to work on. And once that is decided, the next step is to start meshing the geometry. So from there, I'm going to take you to the meshing. And again, our mesh is going to take a little to load. And as you see again, different components are loading. And here's the mesh that we created. So if you have a look at the mesh, um, here we have used a hexa mesh. And um, I'm going to play around with it here so you see different parts of the mesh. Here, for example, you see this is the, um, the exhaust of the, of the system. I'm going to zoom in so you see, for example, this is going to be our outlet. And then we have all of the walls here. And of course, as this is going to present half of this, um, half of the parts of the engine, there are going to be three inlets here. I'm going to zoom in again in one of them, as you can see. This is going to be, and again, one of the inlets. And this is how we have the, we have the, uh, our geometry, our, uh, our mesh. Um, if you want to have a closer look, as, you, as I told you, we use some automatic operation on our platform to generate the snappy hex mesh. Um, so um, here at, uh, in the middle, you can see the fineness of the, of the mesh that we're going to develop. We've chosen a level 3, which is a moderate size. And then here we can, you can see how many, number, how many processors 
you're using to calculate the, uh, the mesh. Once we have it, as you can see, we can even, you know, take uh, 30 tweaks. We can add surfaces for layers close to, close to, for example, walls. But all in all, in the end, we're going to get some sort of mesh that I just um, showed you here on the right. And once the mesh is ready, once we're happy, once we know that this mesh is going to capture the, the features of the flow that we are going to simulate, we can again move to Simulation Designer. Okay, so in the Simulation Designer, first thing to start with is to take the analysis type. So um, the analysis type really depends on what kind of flow we are talking about, how exactly we want to simulate some certain parameters, some certain, certain variables. And uh, as you go forward, of course, you're going to learn what exactly is the, um, the type of analysis, the analysis type that you want to take. For now, since we're going to deal with uh, some considerable pressure changes and some temperature changes, we're taking a uh, compressible uh, analysis type. OK, so as I said, we have a compressible analysis type here. And for this analysis type, we can choose the turbulence model. We've chosen a K-epsilon model. And uh, for this simulation, we just took a steady state. Of course, it could be a transient model. This is not, um, it's, it's not really going to make too much of a difference in terms of setting up the simulation. And then here we have, um, here we have um, our next step, which we have to choose the domain. The domain in, um, in this case is going to be the mesh that we created. So this is going to exactly mention what um, <clears throat> mesh is going to be used for um, for the uh, for the simulation. So as 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 I told you, we created the mesh in the mesh creator. Here, the name is uh, Step New Mesh. So as you see here, I've assigned that one for the meshes, and that is going to tell the solver that you're going to use this specific simulation, this specific mesh that I've created to run the simulation with. And then, once we are again happy and satisfied with this, the next step, as we've done it here, could be to simply make the, the, uh, the simulation setup easier, is to set some topological entity sets. So we use topological entity sets to set, to create a group of topological entities and uh, simply make the, make the setup of the simulation easier and, uh, and faster. So um, since we had three different types of um, major entities in our, in our simulation, as you can see, I've grouped them here. So we have inlets, which are these three inlets that I mentioned while the mesh was, being, was, while the mesh was created. And then we have one outlet that you can see here. This is the outlet that we have. And the rest of the, uh, of the surfaces of our geometry are going to be walls. So of course, this is going to be easy since from now on, we don't need to deal with any further details. The only thing that we have to know is that we have inlets, we have an outlet, and we have walls. And from now on, we're going to simply work with them. A final check on the mesh to see how big is the mesh, everything is okay. If you're sure, then we really go forward to set up the, the model for the simulation. Okay, as you see here, we have to define the, uh, the thermal model that we use for the simulation. It, roughly speaking, this is going to define the material that is going to run inside the exhaust manifold, and it is setting up its physical properties. And, um, we can go through details, but roughly speaking here, we have used the material for air. And um, of course, the, the, some of the properties like temperature, they're going to change as the, as like, I'm sorry, like density, they're going to change as the temperature is going to be different. So um, with this, we can go to the next step, which is setting up the initial conditions. Um, setting up initial conditions is uh, quite an important step because um, depending on what type of simulation you're doing, it could even um, determine if the simulation is going to give good results, if it's going to reach those results fast or not. So I suggest that um, when you want to set up your, uh, your uh, initial conditions, take your time, make sure that whatever condition you're going to choose is relevant, close to what you want to finally get, 
And uh, because you're going to see as you go forward, choosing the right initial condition is going to make a big difference in, in getting the right results you need or maybe getting some results that are not necessarily relevant. Okay, so for pressure, here we have um, use the pressure of 100,000 pascals, and which are um, partly close to the, oper the operating conditions that we had in mind. For the velocity, initially we assume there's, um, there's a zero velocity. Of course, um, ideally it could be that we set some initial pressure, initial velocity at each point in the, um, in the domain, but for now we've chosen only zero. And we have some temperature. Um, it's just set to a normal temperature. Again, this could be taken to a, to a temperature closer to, to, for example, to what uh, comes from the inlets. And uh, for the rest of the parameters, we have the dynamic viscosity. We've initialized it with the value we chose from, uh, from the physical properties. We have the kinetic energy and epsilon both. For uh, both of these are turbulence models that are connected to the k epsilon model that we chose. Here, um, the normal practice is to make some estimations based on the size of the domain, the velocities that you estimate are going to be involved. So um, again, as you gain more experience with the simulations, you're going to um, learn good estimations and learn how to exactly make close, um, close estimations for, for these two parameters. And finally, here we have the turbulent thermal diffusivity which is again calculated from, from the physical properties that I earlier mentioned. So this concludes our initial conditions. Now that the initial conditions are set, we go to our boundary conditions. So I, I stressed enough how the, uh, the initial conditions are important, and, but I really cannot stress how boundary conditions are going to finally determine how your simulation is going to go. Firstly, because they really define what the operating conditions are. They define what an actual inlet is, what kind of inlet do we have, what kind of walls do we have, or they define what kind of outlet do we have. So um, first, they're going to choose what, what are the physical operating conditions. That's why it's very important to choose them right. Secondly, again, they're going to determine if the final uh, simulation is going to run, if it's going to give the good results, or simply if it's going to throw some numbers out that you know we cannot make any, any real conclusions from. All right, so uh, as you see, for each um, physical variable that is involved in the simulation, you're going to assign boundary conditions. So um, here we have the inlet boundary condition, which is setting the velocity for these inlets that I mentioned earlier. So as you can see them, um, now they're highlighted. These three boundary conditions, we, in this simulation, would like to define some sort of mass flow rate for them. It means that at all times during the simulation, we are setting a mass flow rate of, um, of um, 0 0.02 kilograms per second, and this is going to persist throughout the simulation. And um, the next boundary condition is for walls. Um, typically, the velocity at the walls is going to be zero for normal surfaces. We call this the no-slip boundary condition, which means that any layer of the fluid that is completely adjacent to the wall is going to stick to it and have zero velocity. And this is, uh, this is enforced by putting a fixed value velocity which is equal to zero. And as you can see, when I assign the, the, the boundary condition, I just assign it to those topological entity sets that I mentioned earlier. So we don't need to know what exactly was the name of the face. We just group them together, give them a meaningful name, and we use them to assign. And, um, and finally, for velocity, we have an outlet boundary condition. Here you see I've chosen an inlet outlet. So inlet outlet actually is a little more advanced than simply enforcing a zero gradient. So it kind of accounts for, uh, for uh, reverse flow. So in case, because of the pressure, uh, pressure variations, we had some reverse flow, the inlet outlet is going to account for some, um, some value of the velocity that is turning back. OK. These were boundary conditions for the velocity. Next, I'm going to show the boundary conditions for, for the epsilon. So epsilon was one of the two turbulent uh, variables that we had. Um, so again, for each uh, phase, we have to choose a boundary condition. For the inlet, we're going to define some, uh, some, uh, some fixed value for it, which is the turbulence dissipation. And here, we've chosen 50. 
and this was again the same value as we chose for the initial condition. The meaning is that the uh, the flow that is entering from the inlets is um, is by its character turbulent, and then we're going to characterize this by these two k and epsilon values. So we've chosen this value 50 for the turbulent dissipation at the inlet. For the walls, we have wall functions that are going to uh, to read the uh, the boundary condition at the walls based on some uh, some functions. There are different models, of course, but here you don't need to uh, really worry about the details. We take care of it on the back end, and um, and you just have to mention that okay, this is a wall, so I want to choose a wall function for this uh, for this parameter. And for the outlet, again, we could choose zero gradient, but what we do is that we choose inlet outlet to again take into account the possibility of having a reverse flow. Moving forward with the other turbulent uh, variable that we have, we have a K. As I mentioned, because we want to have some turbulent uh, inlet flow, we choose some uh, turbulent kinetic energy at the inlet. Here we use this, 0.25 at the inlet. And we also can play around with this intensity. Here is a typical value that is normally used. So we leave it like that, assign it to the inlet, and that's going to define how our turbulent uh, variables look like at the inlet. Again, for the walls, we use the wall function and uh, assign it to the walls, similar to the epsilon. And for the outlet, again, inlet outlet is going to be completely enough. All right, uh, next step is temperature. So um, here, we're going to give um, a value, as you can see, which is um, quite large. Because um, if, um, if, you, if you see how the manifold, how the exhaust manifold is going to work, the hot gas that is pressurized is going to come from the inlets inside the domain. That's why we have to take into account the, um, the possibility that the inlet gas is very hot. That's why we choose this constant um, large temperature. And, um, and this is going to determine in, in future steps how much heat is going to be, heat is going to be wasted from the, from, for example, from the walls of the geometry. For temperature at walls, we use a zero gradient. The physical meaning of this boundary condition is that we don't want to allow any uh, loss of temperature from the from the walls. And of course, as um, as was mentioned by Johannes during the uh, the presentation, this is quite an important assumption because we want to use this energy that we created and not waste it. We want to use it in different steps to increase the efficiency of our our engine. So, uh, and finally, for the for the outlet, use the zero gradient and assign it to the outlet boundary condition. Okay, moving forward with turbulent uh, thermal diffusivity. For the inlet, again, as a, um, as, a, uh, as a turbulent boundary condition, we assign it to the inlet, and we can use this calculated. This calculated boundary condition means that the solver is going to calculate this value from other uh, physical conditions that it has during the, uh, during the simulation. So, Simply by choosing calculated, you're saying that I don't know the value at the inlet, but I know that during the normal course of simulation, the solver is going to know it. Therefore, you don't need to define anything for it. For the walls, we use the same thing, a wall function. These two values, as you see, are typical values that we use. So for now, you don't need to worry about them. Let's just assign it to the corresponding topological entity and move to the outlet. Same applies to the outlet, so we can use a calculated boundary condition, which means that this value at the outlet is going to be calculated in the course of the simulation from the rest of the calculations. You don't need to assign anything to it. Another very important condition, pressure at the inlet. So normally, um, what we try to do is to, for example, in this case, to assign some velocity at one boundary and assign some pressure at the other boundary. This way, we are going to have a very well-defined system. Otherwise, if you want to, uh, for example, not assign one of these values at one of these boundaries, then the solver doesn't exactly know how to treat a boundary. And that's why that's a very, very common case for, for, the, for the simulation to, to diverge. So as you saw earlier with the velocity at the inlet, we assigned this mass flow rate. It means that that is going to uh, define what the value of the velocity at each time step is. Therefore, for the pressure at inlet, we simply say a zero gradient. And then the solver is going to, based on this condition, determine the value of the pressure at the inlet. Moving forward, uh, we, have, uh, we have the pressure at the walls. A typical value for pressure at the walls is zero gradient. 
We take the same thing, assign it to the walls, and move forward. Finally, we have the outlet that, as I said, since the velocity at the outlet was not defined, the value was not defined, it was defined by some uh, inlet outlet condition. Here, we have to choose an outlet boundary condition that defines the value of the pressure. If you remember, our initial conditions for the pressure were the same value as we have here, uh, 100,000 pascals, and we keep the same, so it means that the uh, pressure at the outlet is always fixed, and the flow needs to adjust itself to that pressure. We assign it to the outlet, and this is going to be our boundary conditions for pressure. Finally, we have dynamic viscosity. Same applies like the turbulent uh, thermal diffusivity. Same applies for dynamic viscosity to the inlet. The solver is going to calculate, so we quickly assign that. Ball function for it, similar to that. And finally, the outlet, where the value is going to be calculated from. Uh, the normal operations of the of the solver. And this concludes, I would say, a very important part of our simulation setup, setting up the boundary conditions. Again, I cannot stress how important this step is, so just take your time, make sure the, kind of, the type of boundary conditions that you're using are going to fit the purpose you are running the simulation for. And then here we move forward to uh, setting up our numerics. Well, since we chose a, uh, a compressible simulation, um, normally solving a compressible simulation is a little more challenging than, um, I would say, for example, incompressible solutions. Because we are dealing with variations in temperature, we are dealing with variations in pressure, we are dealing with variations in density as a result of the other two. So um, it is very important to set up uh, the simulation in a way that we can guarantee the stability of, of, the, of the simulation in general. So um, I would just roughly go through some of these, um, but these are going to be good practices. So in future, when you want to um, run some simulation, especially if you're dealing with some, um, some, uh, in some compressible simulations, it is good to have in mind these, pra these good practices. Maybe they're going to be helpful for you. So the first one is the relaxation factor for some of the physical variables. Here you can see we have a relaxation factor for pressure, for density, for, for velocity. Basically, you can introduce these relaxation factors to any of the, uh, of the physical variables that are involved in the simulation. And the meaning is that when the solver is going to calculate this from its discretized equations, applying a relaxation factor is going to evolve this, uh, this physical variable in time, uh, not simply with what, the, what comes directly out of the solver, but it relaxes the outcome and relaxes the increments of the, of the, of the uh, simulation. So this guarantees that, for example, in a simulation like this, as we march into the iterations and try to calculate the next steps of, of uh, the values of each of these physical variables in, the, in its next steps, um, the solver is going to relax the values. So. Um, so if for some, some reason we have conditions that do not match or conditions that are going to cause the solver or some values to diverge, the under relaxation is going to kind of ease up the simulation, the situation and um, increases the chance of the simulation to, to converge. Another um, important step here would be setting up um, some range for the density. And this is important because when the solver wants to calculate the, um, the, the density from other physical variables, it needs to have some sort of range to be able to calculate the variables correctly. For example, as I said, since the pressure is changing, since the temperature are changing, um, very extreme variations in, the, in those two variables could cause the density to be extremely low or extremely high, which is a threat to the convergence of the, of the simulation. Therefore, yeah, it's a good it's good practice to do, to be able to make some estimations on the range of the density and try to impose them by setting up these two values uh, for a simulation. And um, the next step are solvers. We can choose how each of the physical variables involved in the problem uh, are going to be solved uh, and which algorithm, which kind of numerical algorithm we're going to use to solve them. So uh, as you can see, for the pressure, I have used a, a multi-grid um, approach, which is quite stable. Uh, of course, it's not 100%. Um, uh, it doesn't guarantee the uh, the convergence of the solution, but you normally have a good good uh, chance of getting a stable solution 
using this multigrid. And I've used um, also smooth solvers for the rest of the, of the physical variables, for the velocity, and the rest of them, as you can see here, because um, this is also a very um, a very stable approach to to solving um, a system of linear equations for a compressible case. Um, just to show you um, a quick view of our numerical schemes. Again, the next step once when we are solving is to tell the solver, apart from the numerical algorithms uh, that we call solver and are and were presented here. You have to tell the solver exactly which scheme are going to be used to discretize each term in the physical uh, equations. So um, the important ones are the first one here, the time. Since we're using a steady state um, simulation, you have to make sure that we use a steady state time differentiation scheme. Uh, for gradients, we use a cell limited scheme, which means that it is going to make sure each cell is going to be treated in a way not to exceed some certain some certain value. Um, and as you can see, we've tried to take a very uh, conservative approach in setting up this simulation since it's a it's a compressible case. Uh, we've used, as you see, bounded schemes to again make sure not e each part of the domain or each cell is not going to exceed some uh, some general guidelines to calculate the values. Otherwise we're going to uh, run into some problems with, with the convergence. And uh, this should actually be the last step in setting up the simulation. The final thing is simply um, simulation control, which says how many iterations do we want to run the simulation, as you can see here, or how often do we want to write. And of course, one very important thing is the number of computing cores. Um, if you're using a very large mesh, a large case, um, of course you want to use um, you want to use more computing cores. Otherwise, you use just uh, fewer computing cores because after a while, of course, you're going to lose the, uh, you lose the efficiency of calculation if you use too many cores for a very small small problem. On our platform, you can choose how long eventually you want to run uh, run the simulation, and um, that base that is basically it. With this, our simulation setup is complete. So as you can see here, once this is done, I I could check my simulation, make sure I have not forgotten anything, and then create a new run. And then that's it. I can run the simulation. And here, as you see, we have different runs. This one was successful. On the on the right, you can have a look at the the convergence plots. So these are a good a representation of how the simulation is going forward. If the values and our, the residuals are moving in the right direction, or if not, they are moving up and down, or even they're increasing. That is going to um, give us some some metrics if the simulation is moving in the right direction or not. So it's also, uh, I think, very important to pay attention to these, um, to these um, plots in the course of the simulation to make sure you're not uh, moving in the wrong direction. Otherwise, it's just going to be a waste of time. And um, that should conclude how we set up the simulation. So um, as, as you can see, I've done this before. I set up the simulation. I ran the case. And um, I can show you how the results look like. Now I go to the post-processor, as you can see. Here on the right, we have in the viewer, we have um, our exhaust uh, manifold system. I can see, turn around, see what different parts of the domain look like. So for now, I'm, um, I'm plotting the temperature, as you can see here in this color map, uh, over the surface of the, of the geometry. So as you see, the, uh, the inlets, were rather high compared to the outlet, but um, as the as the flow uh, um, continues in our manifold system, you see the temperature is being lost. So from from this value, from above a thousand um, one hundred seventy um, uh, kelvins, we are dropping to a thousand sixty. So this is uh, quite interesting since um, we, of course, intended to keep the temperature as uh, high as we can ideally close to the inlet value, this says that, okay, the design decisions that we made, the, the profile of the, of the manifold, the, the choice of, uh, of the boundaries, is going to have a temperature difference of, as you can see, something about um, just uh, maybe 15 kelvins. Uh, if you want, we can have a look at the other, um, other variables. For example, we can have a look at the pressure here. Um, this is going to be 
the value of pressure. Of course, you don't have to necessarily, if you want to generate some sort of nice snapshots, you can, I don't know, hide, show, even use the filters to, um, to put it back on. But here I want to show how the values look like, so I put it back. As you see, this is the pressure. At the inlets here we have the value. Of course, the, as, you, as you can see, the distribution of the pressure is not necessarily uniform because we didn't set the value of the pressure at the, at the inlets. But uh, if you look at the outlet, it has a uniform value as it, as it was imposed by, uh, by our boundary conditions. And, uh, and of course, you should, um, when you do it, you should feel free to play around with all of these filters that you have or maybe visualize different, uh, different fields um, or even go back and forth in time to see how the, the flow is developing. And, um, and that should maybe give you a more clear picture if your design is already good or if you have to make modifications. So with this, uh, the demonstration of the simulation, our platform is finished. Uh, I would like to now go back to the slides and um, continue um, just a very quick wrap up of, um, of what we did. Uh, maybe having a quick look at the results, what they meant, and then we can move forward to our, uh, our homework. I just try to be a little um, faster because I don't want to lose time and it would be nice to also hear some of your questions and try to answer them. So um, to wrap up what we did, um, we started with uploading a CAD model and generating a mesh. So um, there are different CAD, um, there are different formats to define a um, a CAD model. Here we use the step file, and um, as I as I mentioned before, we use some automatic uh, dominant meshing algorithm to to generate the proper mesh for our simulation. Um, so these were the steps that we took. If you want to um, if you want to dig further in this direction, um, there's always um, mm, an open question if your CAD model is clean and if it's suitable to run a um, a fluid dynamic simulation. Um, I wouldn't go through details here. I just want to mention one thing that when you want to run a fluid, uh, fluid dynamic simulation, you have to make sure that the only thing we need is the volume that the fluid is going to run in. So no features of the geometry in terms of, for example, having the solid parts, nothing like that is going to help us. It simply is going to make the, the action of creating a mesh more difficult. So make sure your geometries are clean. Make sure they're, they're uh, well prepared for a fluid flow simulation. Of course, you can in, always, when you created the, the mesh, you can assess the quality. For example, on our platform, you can do a mesh clip, see how the mesh cells look inside the domain, and based on that, uh, make sure that this this uh, mesh is already good enough to start the simulation on, or maybe you have to create another one. And um, you can add layers, as I as I showed. You can assign some faces on the geometry to add layers which are going to resolve the features of the flow close to the walls with higher accuracy. And then we started the simulation. I took you through different, um, different steps. We had the initial conditions, very important. Boundary conditions, very, very important. And of course, once everything was set, once we were happy with it, we could simply start the, the simulation. Um, uh, there are a couple of topics that are quite close to, to, to the topic that we use or um, it means that when you want to do a full-scale simulation, you might also want to consider these topics. One of them is a conjugate heat transfer, which means that um, you want to, you, you can um, run a full simulation which takes into account the exchange of energy between the walls as solids and, um, and, the, and the fluid. So that would be a more advanced way of doing it. Of course, we could use porous zones. And um, as, I, as, I, as I showed you, the numerical schemes are quite extensive, so you really have um, many, many choices. Um, so uh, it's also advisable to take your time, maybe do some reading about these numerical schemes to be able to set up the simulations that are uh, more robust. And the final step was the post-processing. As, as you saw, we, um, we took the results. Depending on the type of simulation, we could have, um, we could, uh, have some transient handling of the simulation, which means we could see how some of the fields are evolving through time or through through the, uh, the iterations of the simulation. You could draw streamlines to see how the flow moves if there are some features in the geometry that cause some energy loss. And as we saw, we could, um, we could uh, visualize the flow for different fields. For example, here on the left, you can see we visualize one for temperature. Um, 
Uh, of course, what the solver offers is not necessarily the endpoint. You might have some other uh, metrics to to measure if if you find the simulation was good. We can have um, we can calculate additional uh, physical variables from uh, from what we already have. Uh, this either could be done could be done by some manual uh, post processing or what the solver offers. And of course, there's always I mean you can you can never spend enough time on this. There's always the chance that you go deeper and deeper into into seeing the results, into trying to make some conclusions from them, and of course making some uh, some some design decisions based on these conclusions. So um, again, very quick, if you look at the um, the results that we just uh, saw in the platform, here on top we have uh, the temperature field um, in our domain from two different views. Um, as as Johannes mentioned, in this case. The, the biggest aim is to not lose energy because um, actually creating this energy is very important. Uh, was important, and now that we have created such an energy, we just don't want to let the exhaust uh, go to waste. So we want to use the pr pressure and we want to use the temperature to run some other parts of the system. That's why in this case we look at the temperature uh, and we look at the pressure drop in our domain. Uh, of course, these um, these two these uh, four images should give you an idea how much the temperature is dropping, which parts of the domain, and uh, which features of the geometry cause uh, more um, loss in the pressure or temperature, and it 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 can actually help us to improve those features, maybe the curvatures, with the with the sizes, and then uh, finally come up with a final final model. Okay, so now um, we are done with um, our um, Simulation. We went through the details. We had a look at the results. I think now we have all of us have a better idea what um, what was the role of uh, how we have to set up the simulation and what parameters, pressure and temperature, uh, why these parameters are important in uh, in making the final decision. So with this, I would like to uh, take you through what uh, the homework is going. Third homework of this workshop series is going to look like. Um, as you can see, the geometry in this air duct. And, and top and right. So we are going to provide this geometry for you on the platform uh, right after this workshop finishes. So you can uh, check it out, you can play around with the geometry. And as always, we offer the homework on two different levels. So the first one, we would like you to just run a simplified flow simulation in the geometry that we give you. Um, I suggest, if you do not have uh, much experience with it, start with an incompressible. Just go through the steps that we had. Um, feel free to make any sort of decisions that um, that sounds logical to you, with the physical quantities, with boundary conditions, initial conditions, um, and in the end, try to make the simulation work. Try to visualize the results. See if you're happy with it. And in the second level, it would be nice to um, see if you can uh, propose some modifications to the geometry that. Um, that solve some of the issues that the geometry have. For example, you might um, run the first level, get some profile of, uh, of temperature difference, and see that one feature in the geometry is causing a huge loss in the in the temperature, which means you have a huge loss in the energy. Then um, you could modify the geometry, uh, do the process once again, and um, and see if that that modification solves the problem. Again. You're going to find this geometry available uh, right after the uh, the workshop, and of course, you always can go to to our website, our in our uh, workshops page to um, to uh, to have the to to have any information you need um, regarding regarding this homework. Um, of course, um, this now it's it's time for our um, question and answer. Apart from the fact that we're going to have this uh, prepare this uh, homework soon, maybe um, in a few hours, um, if there's anything that you would like to ask now, uh, I'm here. Also, uh, Johannes is available. So um, let's see if um, if you have a couple of questions here. All right. So um, here I see a question. The question is, how long took the program to converge? Um, so we were running a um, a um, a steady simulation, and we were running with uh, eight cores. And for that one, it took us something about one hour to to get results that were roughly looking good. Of course, it's always a matter of uh, the size of the mesh, but this is what uh, 
this simulation that you just saw took us. Okay, and um, I'm scrolling through through the questions. Let's see. Um, okay. Well. Um, All right. Um, we have a question uh, regarding the, uh, the the mesh. The question is how um, how did you choose to to create uh, an automatic mesh and why not uh, different types of mesh? Well, this is a good question. I mean, we always have um, have this question: if this type of the mesh is going to be suitable for our simulation, and it's not just about if it's a fluid dynamic simulation or not. It could be about um, the range of the velocities, the range of the pressure that. Um, that uh, that are involved in the simulation, the type of the analysis type for incompressible or for compressible, or for example, having certain features in our mesh like layers close to surfaces. Um, so uh, it's always, I mean, there's never a certain a final answer to this question. But in our case, we wanted to set up a simulation that is um, easy to uh, to set up fast, and at the same time, something that gives meaningful results, something that that could actually be used for industrial. Um, industrial applications. And I should say that the automatic feature, automatic mesh generation feature on our platform was actually a, uh, a, a very uh, capable, capable option. That's why uh, we, chose, uh, we chose this. Okay, um, now we have a question. I'll just read it for everyone. Can SimScale use a variable input during simulation for temperature and pressure? For example, simulating firing fuel in cylinders and closing valves. The answer is yes. Um, when you're using um, a, a simulation, you can define uh, the values of the, at the boundary conditions as a function of time or as a function of space. Um, for example, as, I, as, as you sign the results, we have um, pressure distribution at um, a uniform pressure distribution at the outlet. So we simply said we want the pressure to be uh, 100,000. But um, you might know from some experiments or from other calculations that the pressure distribution or the velocity distribution are not necessarily uniform, but with some certain certain profile. Um, or um, in even more advanced cases, if you're running a transient solution simulation, you might realize that you want to change the velocity, make some periodic assumption, or um, simply ramp it up to some final value. Um, so for that feature, we have um, tables, which means you can upload CSV files, or we have file, which means you can we have functions, which means you can define the, the profile of the, of the quantity that you want, in this case temperature and pressure, as a function of um, x, y, z, or as a function of time. Okay, um, we are getting very close to, to the end. I'll just try to quickly look, see if you have, um, if you have more um, questions. Yeah, here we have one more. Uh, how to change mesh parameters in different parts of of the body. Well, um, this is um, there are different different ways we can do it. Um, for example, when we are using a, um, a, um, a fully um, featured uh, mesh operation, um, you can have different sort of refinements uh, in different parts of the domain. So it means that you can take a surface and you you say that I want to add this many layers with these sizes on. Um, on this part of the domain, you can define some sort of uh, uh, geometry. For example, you can define a sphere and say that inside this sphere, I want the size of the mesh to be definitely smaller than this because there's some certain flow feature that must that needs to be accurately resolved. Um, there are actually different features. I encourage you to um, to really dig deeper when you want to do meshing. Uh, see what kind of features are, are available. Of course, if something wasn't exactly clear or um, or you thought it could use some better explanation, I encourage you to get in touch with us with our support. We try to make sure um, it it's going to be easy and smooth for you to uh, to prepare some meshing job or some some simulation. Okay, um, let's see. I'm, I mean, there are um, many questions. I try to. Um, See which ones are repeated more. Uh, so uh, in this little time we have, I um, I can answer at least the most important ones. Um, okay, um, let's see. Okay, um, it, it looks like that we have uh, we've gone through at least the uh, the more important ones, the ones that are repeated um, repeated the most. Then I would like to say that uh, I really enjoyed the. Um, 
this workshop. I hope you also have liked it, and um, I hope it's been um, interesting and, of course, uh, educational for, for many of you. Again, I encourage you to, to do the homework. If something was not exactly clear, get in touch with our support team. We are there to make sure this um, the simulation that you want to set up is going to be done uh, easily. Uh, well, I guess this is it. Thanks again for taking part, and um, I look forward to having you guys for our next workshops uh, in the coming weeks. All right, then uh, goodbye, and um, enjoy simulating.